This is a special Point of the Spear presentation, George Washington at War. Today's guest has portrayed General George Washington at national reenactments and in numerous television and theatrical productions. Living historian and author John Koopman III is here, and I'll speak with him next. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. His book is called George Washington at War, 1776, and author John Koopman III joins us now. John, welcome to the show, and Merry Christmas to you, sir. Well, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure, sir, and uh, for listeners, John and I have worked together on one of my films called America's First D-Day, where he portrayed Washington, as he uh, always does so well. So we're honored to have you on the show, John, very much so. Before we get into the book, I wanted to ask about other aspects of Washington's service. And in particular, the French and Indian War. Washington was considered a, um, an aide de camp, but a, he was not in, in the pay. He didn't have rank, uh, but he was not an aide to uh, General Braddock, British uh, army officer. And Braddock had disdain for what was called the provincial units. Now, these would be, uh, there were some units from South Carolina, there was a New York uh, independent unit, and then, of course, there were the Virginians. They took up to fighting uh, in the, um, what's called the Indian style, which Braddock frowned upon, but they ended up saving complete catastrophe and annihilation. And I must add, the allure of the baggage train. <laughs> The Indians became so fascinated by the baggage that that probably saved a lot of lives too, because they would have, they didn't necessarily chase them across the Monongahela again. But this is yeah. where Washington really shined. Uh, now, there again, I want to read a, an actual. This is an account that he wrote uh, to his his uh, his brother. By the all powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability and expectation, for I had four bullets through my coat, two horses shot up for me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side. So of all the officers, he was one of the sole remaining officers, and he organized a, an orderly retreat, kind of a fire and retire, and it was, there's nothing to say beyond it was simply miraculous that he was not hit, as you can see from the volume of bullets flying in the air. I have that same quote, actually, <laughs> okay. in my, my research, because right. I know of the, um, of the legend of his not being wounded or any of the bullets uh, harming him. And I just want to add that I'm not sure if this is true, but when he was going through that same area 15 years later, an Indian, old Indian chief sought him out and described how they recognized his bravery and they took aim upon him, but none of the, and they were some of the best marksmen the Native Americans had, but none of the bullet struck him, the, the ball struck him. And after a while, the Indian chief said, this man is protected by divine providence. We won't fire on him, you know, for the remainder of the battle. And I don't know how true that is, but it's, it was a story. Uh, so the, ink. Yeah, the historian, who I respect, it's like Edward Lengel, he's a, he's a Washington historian, and he, refers to it as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a legend. Uh, certain uh, historians dispute it because Washington never mentions it, but his son, uh, George Washington Park Custis, thought so much of it, the stories he had heard that he wrote a play. And I don't think George Washington Park Custis was a clever enough fellow to make this story up. <laughs> I think, <laughs> uh, I think he, he heard this story from friends of Washington. There was this Dr. Craig who was with Washington when this potentially happened. So I know historians dispute it, but personally, I think it's true. And um, I think historians don't like it because it's not a primary source, but yet we have a secondary source and 
anyway, I hold to it that it's true. But what ha did actually happen was, we know for sure, was that there was a <laughs> Presbyterian minister gave a sermon who said it's actually the same thing, that this, this young man in Washington has been preserved for some future importance for our country. So, so that is 100% documented but I, I personally hold I, I think that that Indian story is true yeah yeah it se it seemed as I was reading it um, the way it was phrased that it that it would be true because yeah. this uh, chief sought him out um, I want to move forward to the interwar years after the French and India war before the revolution what was Washington working on between those wars well, I think certain historians, I think I missed the, they missed the importance of these years, uh, because as a young man, uh, when he was involved in the French Indian War, he seemed to be very much localized. He was thinking of Virginia. What, what's the good of Virginia? He, he disputed the Forbes Road. There was a Forbes expedition later that was successful with 6,000 men in, in 1759, uh, I'm sorry, 1758. But, um, those interwar years were critical because something transformational happened in his character and that it was almost like he went to some sort of graduate school or college and that I think a lot of it had to do with one of his neighbors, George Mason. Um, he didn't venture forth much out of his library, but he was a brilliant man. So his Washington's mind greatly expanded in his thinking during those 14 or so years from the his involvement in the French and Indian War until the beginning of the revolution where he was growing, he always wanted to be an English gentleman. That was his goal, to be an English gentleman. Hmm. And certain things happened. He, he tried to get a commission in the British Army. He was denied that. And of course, that hurt him. And then he saw other things that he disliked, and he gradually transitioned into wanting to separate. So those interwar years were critical, I think, through his own self-study, association with George Mason and other thinkers like that, he, he was transformed and prepared him for what he had to do in the revolution and thereafter. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Coming up on Christmas Eve, be here for Christmas 1942, featuring author Peter Harmson discussing his book, Dark Christmas. One of the uh, interesting things about war is that it gives us a uh, much deeper knowledge about what it really means to be human, like brings both the proverbially best and the worst in, in, in people. This is uh, even more the case when we are talking about Christmas in wartime. We'll also have radio excerpts and music of the time to recreate Christmas 1942. It's all Christmas Eve on Porn of the Spirit.